I want to talk to you today about collaborative robotics. Um, I'm going to put this uh, across what we actually do across our entire enterprise. So I'll tell you a little about BA systems, where we're using collaborative robotic technology or cobot technology, and then I'm going to go through a little bit and show you some examples of how it's being used, and then I'm going to bring it back home at the end uh, because one of the products I work on in the fields that we, uh, I'm most interested in is, is aircraft electrification, and we're using it even on those classes of products along the way in terms of battery pack development and so forth. A lot of people don't actually know who BAE Systems is, and that's always a bit of a shame because we're a very, very large aerospace company. Uh, historically, we were, BAE Systems was British Aerospace, and back in the 90s, it recasts itself into BAE Systems. Um, as, a, as a large aerospace and defense aerospace company, we make a lot of different products. Uh, we actually still make aircraft, fighter aircraft. We make uh, uh, submarines. We go and make aircraft carriers. We make military ground vehicles. We do electronic systems and all sorts of electronic systems. So particularly in my, uh, my business area, I'm in the electronic solutions sector. We make uh, engine controls, flight controls, other critical control systems. I work very closely with another part of our business which does power and propulsion management. In the Washington area here, you may see the hybrid buses running around King County. Those are actually BA systems, hybrid drives. The battery systems, the power inverters, the motors and so forth are our technology. Uh, we have a lot of support service uh, activities, whether it's ship retrofits. Um, if you go into our headquarters in the United States in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of ser services. Uh, Cybersecurity uh, is a focus area. Radar systems, radio systems. When I look at the poster boards here today, I probably 75, 80 percent of the technologies there are technologies that we're incorporating into our products or ones that we're very interested in along the way. I'm not going to go to a lot of details about who BAE Systems is. Uh, you, of course, can read the slides. You can go on the web and find out. But we are really, there's, there's two parts of the business. The, the legacy business uh, was the, the legacy British aerospace business. Uh, that's BAE Systems PLC. That is the uh, master company of BAE Systems. I work in the United States, so I'm part of BAE Systems Incorporated. <coughs> so we are a wholly controlled entity under BAE Systems PLC and we represent the U.S. side of the business. So we will do the DOD contracting and so forth along the way. Within the United States, there's over 30,000 employees at BA Systems, and you can see from our revenues, we are, we are actually quite a large company. We are the third largest aerospace defense company in the world, and there's a wide variety of products that we deliver. When I go through my discussion today, well, I'll be talking a little bit about cobotics and what we can do with cobotic technology and how we use it primarily in our manufacturing technologies. But I think you're going to see a thread that technology that we may be developing, say, for aircraft production or products that we're developing for military ground vehicles, we're taking these technologies across the enterprise and we're bringing them all over uh, into different areas. So, for example, battery technology that we may have been using in, for, for hybrid drive ground vehicles for commercial transit or is the same technology that we're looking at for electrified aircraft. And, and those kinds of uh, systems along the way. We'll even talk a little bit about things like maritime. So uh, there is a, um, right in Bellingham, there's an American Marine, a company that makes ferries. The hybrid drives, the electric drives for, for those ferries are actually based on products that are coming out of the ground vehicle market. And so again, across the enterprise, we're bringing all these technologies together and with my great interest and hopefully bring them to uh, aircraft electrification. So, We'll have to talk about what is a cobot, and that's kind of a, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting concept. So it sounds like robot, and it is uh, something related to robotics, but it's really a robot that is going to cooperate collaboratively with a human operator. Uh, and that cooperation takes a couple of different forms. So it is generally in physical proximity to the human operator along the way. Uh, secondly, it's very aware of what the human operator is doing and, and they're understanding the steps and they'll support, uh, the, the, say, the production manufacturing operations, test operations along the way. Um, the other thing about it, too, is they're working in a shared workspace. So this isn't, a, this isn't going to be something where, you know, you'll see a big wall and there's welding operations behind it and you don't want to go next to that thing. That, uh, that robot is working with you and so there's a whole series of safety implications, control implications, and so forth. And the task for the cobotic element itself may be quite uh, varied in terms of what you might want it to do. It's not necessarily I'm only doing one task with the systems. We're trying to have them support in many of the operations you may have in a, someone working on the production floor who could be doing many, many types of assembly operations along the way. 
when you think about what a cobotic system is, and I'm going back to our experience with flight control systems, you know, you can imagine that you've got um, some sensors and actuators that we're going to be moving across the aircraft or some element we're controlling. Information is being generated. It's being given to the operator uh, based on perceptions of the operator and so forth. We're closing the loop along the way. And that's really kind of what the, the kind of systems we're talking about. If you take a look at some of the products that we develop, for example, helmet-mounted displays give us the ability to, to display new information to the pilots along the way. Our active inceptors are kind of like smart sticks where we can provide force feedback back to pilots and operators. And so we can work on both the sensory and the perception piece and feed it back along the way. And then we control something like the aircraft. Cobotics are using really the same classes of technologies. There still is some kind of loop closure along the way where we're looking at uh, being very aware of what the operator is trying to do, providing information in a useful manner. We're going to give maybe some feedback back to the system. And at this time, we're actually not necessarily controlling a multi-degree of freedom aircraft. We may be controlling a multi-degree of freedom manipulator. And I'm going to be very broad on what that final effector is. It could be a robotic arm with interchangeable heads and cameras and, and grasping mechanisms. But it could be other things that we affect. We may be controlling lights. We may be controlling tools. It could be something along the other way. So it's a very broad category. One of the things you're going to see in this is that it's not just we program a robot and we let the thing go off and do what it needs to do. But the, particularly because of the collaboration, because of the awareness of the cobotic element, it's going to be very intimately aware of where you're at in the, uh, the assembly process. It may be looking at the same kind of information that your operators are looking at. So the design data that we use to build our products is the data we use to help uh, uh, provide the virtualization or the guidance along the way within the system. So we're integrating all the different aspects to the design life cycle into ultimately providing this, this system that helps us uh, efficiently uh, build uh, our products. Um, again, I talked about, uh, you know, the, the cobotic element operates in, in very close proximity to the operator. So there is a safety aspect of this. Um, you will have to go through your safety analyses and understand what's safe and what's not safe. But many of the, co the, the robots used for cobotic, cobotic operations are designed to be somewhat more intrinsically safe. Uh, they don't have a lot of pinch points on them. They, you can get close to them along the way. They're not going to be overly hot. Uh, they will have a series of force sensors and motion sensors around them. And if, if you're pulling on it something or it seems like it's going to bang into you, it, it kind of knows to back off a little bit along the way so it's not going to hurt you. Now, that being said, we usually say cobots can work very closely to human beings, but there are situations where you still need to have put some protections because, you know, maybe it's doing a welding operation right next to you or something. You do have to have some level of protection along the way. And it does work cooperatively, so it's not just doing its thing, but it is very aware of where you are at in the assembly process or your skills capabilities along the way. So it's, it's much more so than a static product comes through and somebody does an operation. You can imagine the idea that, you know, what if there was no product coming to the production line, but the welder still goes and tries to attempt to weld something, right? That, that would not be a particularly useful system. And the cobotic systems, of course, are much more state aware. The, the form of, the, of the, the robot in a cobot system can, could also not just be a mechanical <laughs> manipulator. Uh, for example, the picture on the bottom here is, a, uh, is actually it's a system that was developed um, for walking around the aircraft and doing visual inspections of aircraft structure. So you, you say, well, you know, the idea of taking images or taking pictures or mechanizing that workflow. That thing is moving around on the tarmac while you have other operators doing their things along the way. This is the kind of, uh, kind of cooperation we're talking about. Um, Jeff's discussion this morning about autonomy and so forth, you know, this is, this is where we're getting to. The, uh, he talked about, you know, the movie The Martian. I was amazed that Matt Damon had to drive the vehicle the whole time. Why isn't it driving itself? Doesn't it know where it's going? Let him sleep when he needs to sleep or whatever is along the way. And so that's, it's awareness of what its mission is, what it's doing and so forth, and where it is in the process that it kind of tries to, uh, you know, uh, be aware of what it's going and trying to do. Um, Across the enterprise, we have got three or, three or more cobotic type activities going along. Um, the one that you may have seen most is our operations in Salmsbury in the UK. In Salmsbury, we do a lot of composite manufacturing for uh, aircraft empennage. So for example, the tail of the F-35 and so forth are built there. And what they've done in Salmsbury is quite interesting, is they're actually having a continuous flow line through the facility 
and there is essentially a monorail uh, holding the key aircraft structures above, trying to do what they do in automotive. Instead of the operators walking over to some physical structure, they're literally standing there next to the cobot, and the element to be worked on is, is brought to them. And so there'll be some operations where the uh, physical human operators are working on it, but they actually have a whole cobotic system that helps countersink and counterbore all these composite structures ready for putting in screws and so forth. And that machine is literally sit, standing right next to them. So it's, it's one of those areas where we get the robot to do what it needs to do well. It's got a line, it's got to try to figure out where it is, make sure it's countersinking in the right place. The operators are standing right next to it and putting screws in and so forth along the way. So it's, it's that kind of cooperation. Um, at Farnborough this year, we actually showed a, a slightly different kind of cobotic uh, workstation. This is one you might be more familiar with, where you have a, you know, a, a, some kind of manipulator. This looks like it's a little KUKA. Uh, many companies make in cobotic robots, a little KUKA manipulator along the way. This is a concept that's being used at Wharton, where they're doing still Typhoon production and so forth, fighter aircraft production. And they're trying to envision what might be the workstation for the future for our operators. And they're really thinking of a lot of different use cases for these kinds of workstations. So for example, something they call a digital training passport. You as an operator, if you go to your manufacturing floor, as an operator is going to walk up, he's going to key in something on the computer, he puts in his ID, he's, he's logging his work. What's going to know what he's trained to do? And maybe we're asking this uh, operator to go build something he's never built before, or his training has lapsed. And so the idea that it's going to recognize who you are, it knows what your skills are, maybe before you go to assemble something, it's going to do a quick video or give you some kind of instruction on how to do the operation, and maybe an operation where you are working with the robot itself, and so the robot will actually show you its bits and pieces along the way and, and, and help you in the assembly. So it's not just I've reprogrammed a robot to do a particular thing, but it is very aware of who you are, what you're doing, and what you need to do to do your next task along the way. So this is one of the concepts that they're, uh, they're working on at Wharton right now. Um, the other area is, you know, of course, the robot can be a robotic assistant. So maybe I'm having a soldering process, or maybe I have a gluing process along the way, and I only have two hands and I need three hands. Well, here's the third hand now. But it's going to be very aware of where you're at in the process. So I'm going to pick up the right thing at the right time, and if you're not ready for me, it's going to wait for you. And maybe it'll prompt you. Maybe it makes a little noise or something along the way. But it's, it's going to be where were you at in the, in the assembly instructions and do the right thing at the right time. The other area, of course, is, is, is little more, uh, I would say, a little more esoteric ideas that, you know, you're going through the assembly process. And if you take a look at, you know, maybe you have a just-in-time manufacturing operation. You've got a series of screws and nuts and bolts that are loaded at that workstation for that operator to work with. And he's told he's got to take an M5 screw and put it in this location here. Well, if the system is aware of where the operator is in the assembly process, it's actually doing things like lighting up the bin that holds the screw. So he's going to get the right screw. He's not searching around trying to remember where it is. Uh, he may be you know, looking at different stuff. He's got paperwork instructions or other types of work instructions. And again, it's that awareness of how you build the product and so forth which gets back to the original design data, the manufacturing plans, all of this gets integrated into these systems along the way. We are taking them even further though. So um, in these systems, the systems you saw for Wharton uh, and so forth, uh, that system actually uses things like uh, Microsoft HoloLens technology. So we're taking this commercial technology, readily available, we can integrate it into our manufacturing and operation processes, provide that layer of different visual context, very much like our helmet-mounted displays and our fighter aircraft. We can take that same kind of technology to the operator. And then we're doing other things with it. It's not just end of, uh, end of production line manufacturing, but even post that. So at American Marine in Bellingham, where we, we actually provide a propulsion system for their hybrid drive ferry, and it supports the uh, red line down in San Francisco, we can actually virtualize the control room. We can take that same information, that same design information, we can actually virtualize the control room, put HoloLens on, have a, either the maintenance operators or whatever it happens to be who needs to work with the system, actually walk through, see the system, be presented with the information along the way. They might understand how to practice the maintenance procedures. We can have our customer ends and say familiarization, all these other bits and pieces along the way, and understand how the processes go together, how we maintain the systems. That same database that was helping you build 
the vehicle or the same database you use to design and qualify your product is the database that you can use to support uh, these systems. Um, area that where I, uh, I'm most interested in is, of course, I work in vehicle electrification. I've done electric battery packs for large transit vehicles. We're looking at battery packs for uh, aircraft. Uh, we heard Roy this morning uh, from Magnix talk about the motor side and, and the work that's happening with batteries and so forth for aircraft. That's something I'm very passionate about. And we're using the same kind of technology to help us in assembly of these battery packs. These things are heavy. I mean, just a small, simple module can be more than a single man lift. They're high voltage. Uh, they have high shorting currents. You've got to be very careful with assembly of these things along the way. And so where we can use automation and cobotic technology and virtualization to help us is very, very useful. This is an example of a, of a high voltage battery pack. This is a 1,200 pounds is the weight of the battery pack alone that may be on top of a transit bus. And this is only, this is a power pack. This is only 32 kilowatt hours. And we're talking about battery packs for electric aircraft. The urban air taxis are 150 kilowatt hours. The small GA aircraft are, you know, 200, 300, 400 kilowatt hours. And so these are large, complex systems, and we want to make sure we build them right. They have a lot of parts in them. I'm going to show you a little video of what we're actually doing and how we've used the uh, cobotic technology and the virtualization technology in the assembly of the batteries. And I think it'll give you a better feel for uh, how way cool this stuff really is. So uh, There's huge growth in this market, but it is unsustainable unless we embrace new technology. BAE Systems is committed to solving the most complex problems our customers have. Here at BAE Systems, we make the electric propulsion for hybrid drive buses. Our production tempo has increased dramatically. We brought on a lot of new people. That's forced us to look at innovative solutions to build product correctly every time. How do we do that? How did we do that? Is with mixed reality. When I first tried a HoloLens, I quickly understood that this technology would have significant implications for our business and that we needed to get out in front of it. We had to find a platform that could help us scale, and that's when we began the conversations with PTC. PTC's mission is to bridge the physical and the digital worlds, whether it's manufacturing, operating, or servicing physical products. We came along and we had a mixed reality solution to allow them to create experiences for the HoloLens quicker and more efficiently. It's all drag and drop. You don't need a lot of technical expertise. You get up and running right away. It just makes it a lot faster and easier to get a lot of people using the experiences that were created with our software. PTC's mixed reality solution has allowed us to drag and drop our 3D models that we already have to create battery work constructions to deliver to our production floor in hours and at a tenth of the cost. We develop a step-by-step -step guide that lets the assembler completely assemble the battery. You're not looking at this in two dimensions anymore on a screen that's far away from you. It's right in front of you. The HoloLens has really become beneficial in allowing us to train new people on this product 30 to 40 percent more efficiently. Using the HoloLens, I was able to cut my assembly time in half. We can understand and we can learn so much faster, efficiently, feel a part of this process. Microsoft has really nailed it with the HoloLens platform and PTC is helping us scale this affordably across the enterprise. 20 years ago, we didn't have personal computers on every bench. 10 years ago, we didn't have 3D printers. Now I can't imagine building without those. And I think this is what the HoloLens represents. It's the next step in the evolution of high-tech manufacturing. The future of mixed reality is really exciting because the possibilities are endless. We're just starting to scratch the surface of it. It really is endless what we're gonna be able to do and where we can go. This is gonna help us get there. And you know, we're taken into a lot of different areas. So uh, Sean Atkinson is, uh, he heads our production operations for our battery pack development and our operations. Um, the, uh, oops, sorry. Um, we're, you know, we're taking that uh, and using it. For example, Sean talked about training. We've had to up our production rate. This new generation battery pack has is, is been a, a quite a big seller. We, you know, we had a challenge that we started the year off trying to make you know, 300 and 400 of those modules a week. So, you know, aerospace doesn't usually do high volume, but we're trying to move into those kind of volumes that you might see low end of automotive. And now we're doing over 500 modules a week. So the ability to take that virtualization technology, train our people on how to use the systems is very important. We're also starting to look at integrating other types of things in the manufacturing process. 
So for example, you may be at a workstation and you're gonna have a torque wrench that you get to calibrate it periodically. You're gonna have to use that torque wrench for this operation and a different torque wrench for this operation. So they're looking at things like, can I have smart torque wrenches? Does it know what screw I'm actually torquing at the time? I don't have to go off and put one tool down and put the other tool up. This tool knows where it's at in space, what screw I'm working on, how do I torque that screw appropriately and go on to the next thing and to the next thing. And so again, it's that area where the collaborative element may be the torque wrench, or that may be the effector, but it's very aware of what you're working on. It's setting itself automatically. It's allowing you to try to get to a very efficient manufacturing operation. And the more efficient we can make this, the more we get our product out there, the more we can generate sales, the more we have satisfied customers. So we're really excited about what this kind of collaborative technology does. And again, I hope you, you know, keep your eyes open. It's not just necessarily a, an effector with a couple of pincher hands, but it could be a robot rolling around the ground, it could be a camera system, it could be a, a tool along the way. If you stand back, think a little bit from a systems perspective, understand how you integrate your design data with the product you're working on, uh, uh, be able to look at the life cycle uh, in terms of not only just manufacturing, training, all of that now becomes very much accessible with this kind of technology. And that wraps up my presentation for today. I thank you for the time and willing to take any questions.